These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. One of the most interesting and often misunderstood trivia facts about the Bronze Age Near East is that many of the stories at the start of the Hebrew Bible, particularly the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, also appear in the myths of Sumer and Akkad. Most famously, the Flood narrative and the Tower of Babel make appearances, but there are also lines that can potentially be drawn from the fall of Adam, Cain's murder of Abel, and even the semi-apocryphal rise of the Nephilim and war in heaven to various tales of ancient Mesopotamia. A number of these have been discussed in passing in other episodes because it's hard to resist mentioning biblical parallels when exploring these stories but I have resisted getting too deep into it because biblical topics are immediately controversial and because they're important enough to a lot of people that they really deserve their own dedicated look. This episode, then, is that dedicated look, returning to some of these stories and their biblical counterparts, at least those in the early book of Genesis. There are, of course, far more biblical topics that intersect very directly with Mesopotamian history, but the majority of these have to do with the formation, rise, and fall of the state of Israel. And this will get its own whole series of episodes once we get into the Iron Age. Also, I won't be able to go as deep as some people would like into these comparisons. And this is partly because as soon as you get into Bible topics, you enter a realm of hundreds of conflicting and irreconcilable viewpoints, many of which are held on the basis of incredibly poor knowledge of Near Eastern history. I once had an actual pastor explain to me that the Assyrians killed King Solomon, and then the Romans were able to conquer the Assyrians and free the Jews because Constantine had converted to Christianity and had God on his side. Needless to say, I did not return to that particular church after that. The main reason I won't go into too much depth, however, is that the sources on both sides of these comparisons are often extremely limited. Some of these Bible stories exist just as summaries of what was probably much longer stories at one point, and even the Talmudic exegesis that elaborates on it, though informed by oral traditions, is often not enough and not firm enough to say too much without getting into speculation. And on the other hand, we will see that the Mesopotamian counterpart stories also sometimes exist only in summary, or have key portions missing from the text, or have other issues that make diving deep into them a challenge. I will, as usual, get as much as I can out of the stories, but I'll avoid over-speculation as much as I can. Anyway, we need to lay some groundwork before talking about a modern religion. Sure, there are modern worshippers of the Sumerian pantheon, but thankfully they are small enough that they are not threatening my life when I make small errors in this show. First of all, no one who speaks about these topics is a neutral observer, and that includes myself. I was an atheist for most of my life, but have recently converted to Christianity. In this show, I hope I've always put the historical evidence first above any modern religious speculations, but when we get to topics like these, there does absolutely exist a tension between the historical sources and the biblical sources. One of the most challenging examples of this is the story of Abraham at the Vale of Siddim, which describes a sequence of wars which, during the Iron Age, are simply anachronistic and more likely reflect the political tensions of Israel's Iron Age kingdom being projected back onto the founding patriarch. But I discussed that back in episode 40, if you want to check that out. Interestingly, though I was, at the time I wrote that, a committed atheist, I still stand by the conclusions I drew there, including the end note that you can still be committed to the Bible and accept historical evidence around this particular episode, so long as you aren't a 100% biblical literalist and are willing to see the book of Genesis as at least partly the work of men, or as a work of God which includes non-historical elements acting as literary devices for moral improvement. And though I won't be discussing this episode of Abraham's life in 
this episode, that same tension exists when comparing Mesopotamian and biblical stories. It can be easy to see them as in opposition to each other, to say that one account must be wrong for the other to be right, or to construct all manner of webs around where these stories come from. But what I think is more productive is to keep the preceding hundred episodes of this podcast in mind and give proper respect to the accumulated history of the Sumerians, Akkadians, and their successors, while at the same time giving reverence to 3,000 years of biblical history up to the modern day. There will be irreconcilable differences here, but neither the study of history nor the course of God's revelation have reached their final fulfillment as I write this. The pieces that do not fit together here will someday make sense. And to take the attitude of either the strong biblical literalists who insist that history must be just tossed out when it conflicts with their interpretation of scripture, or the biblical minimalists, some of whom are so radical as to even deny the historicity of the kingdom of Israel, is to toss those pieces away before we're even close to the full picture. And so, having started with way too much preface, I'm going to return us to the very start of this podcast, episode one, in which King Enmerkar of Uruk was sending messengers back and forth to the king of Arata in preparation for a war between the two cities. Now, the full story is long and a bit tangential to our topic today, but in short, Enmerkar is trying to intimidate Arata into surrendering. And in one of his messages, he says to the king of Arata that in order to avoid a war, Arata must send stones, craftsmen, jewels, and all manner of great and precious things to the city of Uruk. There they will construct a holy temple as large as a mountain, a splendid work with the laborers of every nation, and on that day, when Enmerkar rules over every land, and when man is master over all the animals, and there are no more wild predators to threaten humanity, then the Mesopotamian god Enki, who in the early days was one of the gods of kings, as well as being a divine craftsman and wizard, will change the tongues of all these foreigners and cause everyone to speak the same language. It will be that miracle of unified language, as well as the giant tower that they build, which will confirm Enmerkar's right to rule over the whole world. Now, I will say that when we looked at this story way back in episode one, the translation I had at the time saw Enmerkar as looking back into the past to, this t to a time when all nations were under one rule and constructed a holy place as large of a mountain. However, my library has expanded greatly since that first episode, and the more up-to-date translations seem to have it just as I summarized. More to the point, though... The story of a great Mesopotamian king building a tower high enough to reach the heavens and the languages going from many to one should sound awfully familiar to those of you who remember the story of Genesis chapter 11. I will read from the uh, NIV translation because even if some people think other translations are more accurate, the NIV is certainly more readable. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. Now, Shinar being the biblical term for Mesopotamia. Many biblical place names are unclear how they map onto the place names of more historically familiar languages like Akkadian and modern Hebrew, but we are completely sure that Shinar is the general region of Babylonia in particular because it gets mentioned frequently. Anyway, they said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the whole face of the earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan will be impossible for them. Come, 
Let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from all over the earth, and they stopped building that city. That's why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. That last bit about the name of Babel is a pun from Hebrew because the name Babylon and the Hebrew word confusion both sound similar. Of course, King Enrichar was one and a half millennium before the city of Babylon was founded. Consider how far back in time the fall of the Western Roman Empire is to modern times. That's about how much time separates Babylon from the historical King Enrichar, who we are pretty sure was a real person, even if this story was fictionalized. But of course, by the time the book of Genesis was being shaped into its modern form, the city of Babylon pretty much was Mesopotamia as far as foreigners like the Israelites were concerned, much the same way that modern maps call that same region Iraq an Arabization of the name of King Enmerkar's city, Uruk. But aside from these historical notes, it is easy to note two things right off the bat. First, the central narrative. Though each time is a summary of less than ten lines, is basically the same. A Mesopotamian king is filled with glory and power and uses it to build a giant tower to show off. Now, that tower is almost certainly intended to be a ziggurat, of which many were built around Mesopotamia, and some remain impressive ruins to this day. However, in both cases, it is the division of the world into many nations and languages that is preventing such a structure from being built at the time when the speaker is telling us this. But note also that there is a strong difference in tone between the two stories. In Enmerkar's rendition, the great tower is an aspiration worthy of a mighty king, either a deed in the past that a king should try and emulate, or an achievement planned for the glorious future, depending on the translation. In the Bible, this secular glory is a bad thing that needs to be cut down. Now, there are debatable parts of this story, like pretty much every part of the Bible that's been poured over by bored smart people for literally thousands of years, but this core message is not very subtle. Without getting too deep into that, let's look at another, a little more involved comparison, and one of my favorites. In the book of Genesis, the first two humans created by God are Adam and Eve, the ultimate parents of all humanity. They are living in the Garden of Eden and do not experience death or apparently anything unpleasant. But they have one rule. They are not to eat from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The Bible doesn't actually specify that this fruit was an apple, though this is what cultural traditions in the West generally indicate. Anyway, a snake infiltrates the Garden of Eden. Probably, though not certainly, the devil himself, and the snake tells Eve to eat the fruit. Eve says she is not supposed to eat the fruit, because if she does, she'll surely die. The snake replies that God has lied to her, and those who eat the fruit will not die, and instead they will gain tremendous knowledge. Convinced by the snake, Eve eats the forbidden fruit, then gives some to Adam, who also eats it, and then God is mad, and they're punished by becoming mortal. They don't die immediately, but God's promise is fulfilled by the introduction of death into the world, and the snake is shown to be a liar. There are other things going on in the story, but that will do for a short summary. Compare that to the tale of Adipa, which we looked at in episode 31. In this tale, when the gods created humanity, and mostly the wise god Enki is responsible here, at least in my favorite version of the tale, they did not create a single first person or first family. Instead, they created a whole first generation and stuck them all in a single first city. The wisest man among them was named Adipa, and he was the god Enki's favorite person, because both of them are super wise. Anyway, Anapa was out fishing one day 
in a boat when he got in a fight with the North Wind, which in the story is a literal bird. The North Wind knocked over his boat, and using magic powers, Adipa swore at it and broke its wing. Now this was trouble. Adipa had just damaged the North Wind, and there could be no northern winds in the whole world while it was recovering. And Adipa knew immediately that he would have to answer to the many gods for this. And so he turned to his divine buddy Enki and asked for advice. In the meantime, Adipa was summoned to heavenly court to be tried for his crime, and so Enki gave him a bunch of really keen advice for how to impress and charm the court of heaven and the father of gods on. But he also said, Hey Adipa, even if you do this, there's still a pretty good chance that An is going to rule against you, and he's going to offer you the bread of death. If you eat this bread, you will die. So you need to make sure that you definitely do not eat the bread of death. In fact, it's probably safest if you just don't eat anything at all while you're up there. And so Adipa nods his head and agrees with Enki, then goes up to the court of An. When he gets there, he uses all the tricks that Enki taught him, plus his own natural charisma, and really charms the heck out of An and all the gods. An is, in fact, genuinely so impressed that he tells Adipa he never realized that humans could be as cool as he is. And as a reward, An brings out the bread of life, which Adipa may eat and become immortal. Now, it isn't completely clear if this will just make Adipa immortal or his progeny, or all of humanity, but most scholars assume that the bread is intended to give a large amount or all of humanity immortality as soon as Adipa eats it. But Adipa remembers Enki's warning, do not eat the bread of death. And he's way overthinking things, and he's no longer sure if An is just tricking him. After all, bread is bread. Adipa's not a god. How is he supposed to know the bread of life from the bread of death? The dialogue goes back and forth a few times over the matter, but ultimately Adipa says he had received a commandment from his god Enki not to eat anything while in the heavenly court. And An ends up sending Adipa back home, having missed his chance for immortality. Now, sadly, with this second story, we know that An and Enki get together and have a discussion, and An asks Enki why he had told Adipa not to eat any food in the heavenly court. But the clay tablet is broken at exactly the location where Enki explains himself, and so we're ultimately left to speculate as to whether Enki tricked Adipa, much the way that the snake tripped Eve in Genesis, or if he was simply mistaken and gave bad advice, or if perhaps he had deceived Adipa with noble intentions and there was some complex something-something going on there. Whatever the case, there are clear points of parallel here. A common ancestor from the first generation with surprisingly similar names is given commands from God, and another command from a slightly lesser celestial entity, and chooses the wrong thing, letting death take hold of humanity in the world. But of course, there is also the thematic inversion here as well. Adam, through his ignorance, is seen by God as worthy of immortality until he disobeys God's commandment, whereby death enters the world. Adipa, by contrast, is born mortal and impresses the god An so much that he's deemed worthy of immortality. But in obedience to the command of another god, he rejects the immortality and remains mortal. Without going into other scriptures that discuss God's higher plan and other parts of the whole revelation of God that talk about this more, the story of Adam and Eve is one purely of fall, where disobedience to God and trusting the adversary results in mortality. Adipa's story, on the other hand, is a much more nuanced tale, and while the result is the same, it's much harder to paint any party in this story as a clear villain, 
especially while Enki's motives remain lost to history. Now, this isn't to say these two stories exist in opposition to each other. Uh, one is being told for very clear didactic purposes, while the other was likely once an accompaniment to a lost Mesopotamian ritual or festival that later on became the sort of a scribal exercise because it was enjoyable literature. Still, this thematic inversion between Mesopotamian myth and biblical stories tells us something very significant about the biblical Hebrews. And perhaps no story more clearly exemplifies this than the biblical tale of Cain and Abel. In the Bible, Cain and Abel are the first two sons of Adam and Eve. And in their story, they have been instructed by God to give offerings, and so they each give a portion of their produce at a certain time. Abel is a shepherd and offers an animal sacrifice, while Cain is a farmer and offers plants. God prefers Abel's offering over Cain's, and there is much theological speculation as to the causes of this. But whatever else is going on in this story, God is showing a preference to the shepherd over the farmer. The fact that Cain then kills Abel in a jealous rage is telling, but a bit incidental to our point here today. Contrast this to a Sumerian fable called the debate between grain and sheep. There was a whole genre of esoteric debates which we looked at in general back in episode 26. In these tales, common everyday items like the plow and the hoe, or materials like copper and silver, or even concepts like winter and summer, would enter into a debate with the high gods acting as referees to determine which of these items or concepts was superior. Have you ever sat around with friends debating if American football is a better sport than soccer? Or whether lawyers are, in general, more wicked than politicians? Or specifically, whether Michael Jordan or LeBron James was a superior basketball player? These stories are quite similar in feel, though they have these inanimate objects acting as their own lawyers in a hypothetical celestial court. And one of the most prominent among them is the debate between grain and sheep. In this debate, sheep points out that it has many high-value uses, such as clothing people, both high-born and low, and it can produce milk, meat, water skins, and its juices are apparently a base for many disgusting-sounding medicinal oils. Grain, on the other hand, points out that it cannot be scattered by bandits or a big storm like a whole bunch of sheep can, and also that it can make bread and beer. The two go back and forth sort of like this, and even devolve into childish insults in much the same way that a real debate might occur. The debates are quite interesting as literary works, but in the end, the gods of Sumer decide solidly that grain is the superior product, and sheep, while nice, is not quite as important. There is no murder in this story. And so, in the settled, primarily agricultural society of Sumer, the gods decree that grain is a favored commodity. In the pastoral context of the early Hebrews, God decides that sheep are favored, and in an interesting twist, the settled pagan society persecutes the pastoralist through murder before running off to found his own cities full of technology, grain, and sin, all of which eventually draw the wrath of God. I will note that the biblical story of Cain and Abel is almost certainly just a short summary of what would have once been a full-length oral tradition at some point in the past. But the point here is that Hebrew society founded itself self-consciously as a rejection of the settled societies that surrounded them. This begins all the way from the Hebrew origin story of Abraham leaving the city of Ur and rejecting the pagan worship he found there, all the way to the formative stories of escape from Egypt and the conquest of Canaan.
Indeed, the very word Hebrew likely comes from the Akkadian word Habiru, which originally designated a class of people who lived outside the structures of civilization. Not all Habiru became Hebrews. Most of them were either just bandits or outcasts, unwilling outcasts, who attempted to rejoin civilization at some point, either through conquest or reintegration. But the biblical Hebrew tribes are those who would come to reject civilization on a doctrinal level. And even when they form into a kingdom of their own, the tensions between settled, often pagan society and the Habiru origins of the twelve tribes would be a constant source of conflict in the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. But that's getting way ahead of ourselves, and the origins of the Hebrews and the development of the kingdom will be major stories in season two once we finally get to the Iron Age. For now, look at how this tension plays out in our stories. The Tower of Babel is either a triumph of civilization or an emblem of the wickedness of settled society. Primordial man either lives in a natural setting and receives absolute judgment from a patriarchal god, or lives in a city setting and receives judgment from a court. God prefers shepherds, while the gods prefer farmers. But there is another perhaps even more famous story, that the two mythologies have in common. Perhaps the most common thing people know about the Mesopotamian connection with the Bible is the famous flood myth. And sure enough, there are many variations of essentially the same story. And whether the hero is called Utnapishtim, Atrahasis, Ziadsura, Deucalion, Yimakishaita, or Noah, the essentials of the story are the same. The earth is full of badness, and God sends a bunch of water, or a bunch of snow in the ancient Iranian version, to wash everything clean, sparing only one righteous man, his family, and some animals. The continuity of the core of the flood myth is itself interesting, reminding us that even if there are major differences in worldview between the settled Mesopotamians and the pastoral Hebrews, there are still many things that are common to all of human experience. That said, there are pretty telling differences when we look at the details of each story. To start with, the Mesopotamian flood hero is depicted as a wise and righteous king of a great city, specifically ancient Shurapak in the most famous version, while Noah of the Bible is the pious and devout patriarch of a pastoral family. Perhaps more importantly, the context of the two stories is different in fascinating ways. In the biblical story, the descendants of the murderer Cain form cities, develop technology and war, and in the apocryphal book of Enoch, which is a trip, also marry and interact with fallen angels, the Nephilim. It is all of this wickedness that God disapproves of, and we are led to understand that even the righteous people are either destroyed or seduced by wicked urbanization until only Noah is left. In contrast, the legend of Utnapishtim, who is my favorite of the Mesopotamian flood heroes because his name is so much fun to pronounce, Utnapishtim, <laughs> king of Shurapak, arr, begins at the creation of humanity. In the Mesopotamian account, the gods do not simply speak to make things. Instead, they must labor on the earth like craftsmen to form the mountains and rivers and things of the earth. However, the lesser gods get sick of having to work all the time and essentially go on strike, refusing to work any more. The matter is ultimately resolved by Enki, the wise craftsman, deciding to create a bunch of laboring slaves out of the mud. These mud-based worker robots are humanity and our purpose in life is to work for the gods. Again, note that for the pastoralist Hebrews, our original purpose was to rule the animals, to worship God, and chill in nature, while the need to labor and till the soil was a punishment for our wickedness. Anyway, 
The problem with humanity in Utnapishtim of Shurapak's account is that we kept having babies, and they kept having parties with loud music, and generally making a racket. Can you imagine babies with loud music? I mean, they're already crying and screaming, and ultimately it was to stop all the loud noises that the earth was flooded. Now, the comparative variations of essentially the same stories with pro or anti-city biases, to put it very crudely, can be more than explained by the stories having the same origin, but morphing over time through oral tradition based on the ideologies of the tellers. Alternately, they can be explained by one culture adapting the stories of the other culture and changing them to suit their own purposes. A secular interpreter may say that the Hebrews took the stories from the dominant Mesopotamian culture around them and altered them for political ends. A faithful interpreter may say that the Hebrews preserved the original forms of the stories from some primordial revelation time before history, and when some people decided to settle in cities again, they changed the Holy Scripture to suit their personal preferences. Certainly, it's not the first time that sort of thing has happened. Also a possibility, even though I've been heavily focused in this episode on links between stories, is that some or all of these stories could have developed independently in separate cultures, which is always a possibility that's overly discounted in comparative mythology. After all, tropes such as the hero's journey are common around the world without any suggestion of divine intervention or secret alien contact between all ancient peoples. Sometimes people write similar stories because there's a certain foundation of humanity common to the entire species. Anyway, I want to close the episode by mm, maybe stretching a bit, going into a bit of my own speculation. And I should stress that this is my own speculation, because whenever I mention Marduk, there are a lot of people that vastly overstate his importance, especially in early myth and the foundations of Mesopotamian culture. Now, it isn't their fault. Marduk is important in later Babylon and a pretty fun character in some of his stories. But for folks that only know a bit about Mesopotamian culture, Marduk is likely one of the few things they've learned about, leading them to overstate his importance. Anyway, let me tell you two more stories. In the beginning, or perhaps a bit before, the Elder Gods created all things. Not humanity yet, but a bunch of things were getting put in place. Anyway, the Elder Gods were content to mostly take naps and allow things to fall in place however they wanted. The Lesser Gods, however, were making a bunch of racket and not letting the Elder Gods sleep. One thing led to another, and the glorious shining light of the Lesser Gods, Marduk, declared himself king over all things, and a portion of the Gods joined his cause. They fought a great war against the Elder Gods and were victorious. They then ordered the world according to Marduk's desires and commanded a great deal of things from their human servants. So that's story one. Story two goes like this. In the beginning, or perhaps a bit before, God created all things. Not humanity yet, but a bunch of things were getting put in place. Anyway... God was hoping to create humanity endowed with free will and allow things to just fall in place according to his great plan. Some of the angels, however, thought that this was an absurd plan since humanity would obviously make a mess of things. And you can't say they're wrong, can we? One thing led to another, and the glorious shining light of the angels, Lucifer, declared himself in rebellion, and a portion of the angels joined his cause. They fought a great war against God and were defeated. Lucifer was not allowed to be in charge or command humanity, and instead God preserves our free will. Now, I hesitate to draw 
too many parallels here. The biblical war in heaven has a large amount of tradition attached to it, much of which may have arisen long after the original scriptures describing it were first narrated. While the Enuma Elish, the tale of Marduk's great war related back in episode 29, has a number of details that don't necessarily conform to the strict one-to-one -one equation of Marduk to Satan. Aside from these differences, the core narrative of a rebellion or usurpation war is so common throughout history and so constrained in how many forms it can take that these could well be independent narratives. After all, a charismatic lieutenant attacking the established leader, I mean, a story like that can pretty much go two ways. You win or you don't. But still, there is an enduring tradition in the Christian world as seeing the polytheistic gods of pagan societies as manifestations of Satan. And for the chief god of the most hated nation to have an origin story so similar to the adversary of the Old Testament, though with different beliefs as to who was ultimately victorious based on whose camp you were literally living in, is suggestive enough that it seems worthwhile to investigate a possible link. Anyway, one could write whole libraries on the topic of Bible stories. And indeed, there are people who have done exactly that over the last 3,000 years. This was meant principally as an introduction to the main parallels specifically in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And though I've tried to be as neutral in examining this as possible, I'm still pretty sure I've irritated at least someone, given the impossibly wide range of views on all of these topics. If you did enjoy this, you can look forward to a bit more discussion of it, though not for a while, because it's still not time to enter the Iron Age. I'm not sure what will be coming next on the podcast, but I have a few more general overviews of the Bronze Age that I want to put together, as well as perhaps go over a few of the smaller items that I missed going through in Season 1. So join us next time for whatever I managed to put together. Thank you for listening.